I, I mean, he was trying to put his hands down on the floor and his all his bones were broken on his hands. So it, it looked like jello. I can't even explain it. It didn't even look real. It looked like a cartoon. And the way that they were beating him and, and the way they stuck the, the broom, like it was, I had never heard a human scream like that. And you know, I've, I've done damage to people. I've heard, I've seen people do it. I had never seen a human, I had never heard a human being cry like that. It really changed me that day. We're here with JC from Wrong to Strong. He's got a great story, great testimony, and uh, we're gonna start from the top. So can you tell me how you were raised and where you were raised? I was born in Chicago. Um, my, my parents uh, came over from Mexico at a very young age. They started having kids. They got married at 14 and started having kids at 15. So they had me when they were 16 and you know, kids having kids. My, my dad fell in love with the gangs, the drugs, and, and just the city life. We, we, we came from my family from a small town in Mexico so that, that really didn't exist over there. So when he got a taste of the, that fast life, uh, fell in love with it and, and he ended up uh, abandoning my mom and just kind of left her fend, fend, fending for herself. And uh, my mom was young, um, didn't speak English, had never worked a, you know, a day of her life. She was pretty much just a housewife. Uh, that's what she did. And now we were at a hotel, homeless, um, and my dad was gone. How old were you at that time? Four. I, I remember small little things, I remember all our stuff in the car. I remember the hotel was green. I remember little small stuff, but I also remember the pain that I could see on my mom's face that day. I think that's what I remember the most. So from being in hotels with your mother, uh, where did things go from there? She had to move in with her brother um, and when she moved in with her brother, uh, he was the person that started uh, molesting me, uh, raping me. He uh, had a dark room where he would lock me in for hours and uh, he would torture me with water. He, he would drown me and, and pull me out. Um, it, it was torture. How often did that happen? A lot, a lot. Um, all I remember is, uh, you know, getting beatings for like nothing, you know, uh, opening up uh, the gallon of milk on accident when there was one open or eating something that I didn't ask for. It was always a beating for the smallest things and, and um, I got used to it. I got used to it and I became numb to the beatings, I became numb to the rapes, I became numb to the drownings and I became numb being locked in that dark room. When he came around but wasn't actively doing those things, what was he, what was he like? Like, how would, would he just communicate normal with your mother and? Yeah, it was, um, it was like having a, a relationship, I guess you could say, with somebody that's bipolar. Um, one minute he was beating us, uh, another minute he was taking us to Grand America. You know, um, I grew up very confused, very, uh, I think it's one of the biggest things where I really never learned like what was right, what was wrong, or like, I mean, I, I, I got beatings for pretty much anything and everything. So uh, by the time I was nine, I mean, my, my heart was completely stoned already. Um, I always tell people at nine, I felt like I was already a grown man. Um, and I, I wanted blood, I wanted revenge. I wanted to hurt people. I wanted to hurt people the way I hurt it. Do you think that anger all came from what your, your uncle did to you, or do you think it came from other places as well? Well, it, it had a lot to do with him, but it also had to do with, you know, my father leaving and, and putting us in that situation and, you know, him not, not caring, you know. Um, 
my, my dad was, was my hero my whole life. He still lives to this day. I, I don't change how I look at him. I just wish he would have done something. So at nine, where do you go from there? At nine, my mom really didn't mix well here in the United States. She didn't like it. So she ended up moving us back to Mexico. Um, I was already highly, highly damaged. So uh, I spent most of my time running the streets in Mexico. And, and um, I got into a lot of trouble in Mexico. And Mexico is, uh, I started hanging, a lot of people think that I started hanging out with gangs in, in Chicago, but my, I started hanging out with gangs in Mexico when I first started getting into trouble. And, you know, I was 10 years old and I was hanging out with guys that were 18, 19 years old. And, and Mexico was very different back then. The gangs would all meet up in one place and fight like back in the days, you know what I mean? Uh, they call them riñas. Um, and I, I just learned to to fight, to take beatings. I mean, I'm not that much of a good fighter, but I could take I could take a beating, and uh, I just became numb, man. I became numb to feeling any kind of any kind of good, I guess. So besides the fighting, what else were you and your new friends in Mexico doing? I started drinking heavily. Started smoking cigarettes. Um, you know, I started messing around with women. Uh, and what age is this again? 10 years old. You know, uh, they always brought girls around. They were older and the girls would always pass out drunk or, or something. There was always girls around. So like I was already having sex at that age. I was already very misled, you know, with sex and, and drugs and, and just alcohol. Just. Would your mother, you know, catch you doing any of these things or how involved was she? My mom was just so busy with work and trying to survive with three kids by herself in Mexico that I, I don't think she really comprehended like how bad things were or how bad things were about to get. And she pretty much made me the man of the house. You know, she was like, you're the man of the house. You get to do whatever you want. You tell me what you want to eat. And, you know, I started drinking very heavily because I, that I stuck that in my head that I was, you know, the man of the house. And, you know, I went and I got myself a job and I started helping my mom, you know, pay bills. But I was still very out of control. I was still very, I would steal a lot. I, I was always running the streets. I, I mean, I was, Always up to no good, and finally one day my mom just got tired, and you know she she beat me, and my mom would beat me a lot too. You know, um, my mom wasn't well either. My my dad did a number on her too. You know, so she would beat me, and and one day I just I had enough, and I told her, you know, you're not gonna do this to me no more. You know, I'm a, I'm a grown man now. And she's like, okay, then I'm gonna send you to your dad's house then. And my dad lived in Chicago at the time. So she sent me off to my dad's house. I, I got to Chicago in 1988, summer. It was hot. He was waiting for me. My, my whole family was waiting for me, the Almanzas, me and my grandfather, my grandma, everybody was still alive back then. And, you know, I, I remember getting off the plane and saying, you know, wow, you know, I finally have a family. But when I got to my dad's house, uh, you know, my dad was always gone. He was always dating somebody. I was always home by myself. So I started running the streets again. I started running the streets and getting into trouble. And um, finally my grandparents stepped in and they said, no, you're gonna come and live with us. But I, I was, like I said, I was already so damaged that, you know, they were old. They couldn't, they couldn't, you know, control me. I would jump out the windows. I would run away. Um, and finally, I just, I just ended up, you know, joining a gang and, and I ran away from home and I just never, never went back again. I want to stay kind of uh, on the topic of when you were a kid, you said, you know, you grew up quickly, is what you're saying, and you you know already drinking and doing these things at ten. 
Do you remember what it felt like, what emotions it brought when you felt, you know, maybe the first time getting drunk or uh, having affection from a female like that? Did it kind of provide anything you were looking for or was it just something that everybody was doing and you, would, you were just going along with it? Honestly, I didn't, I didn't have no feelings. Um, I was very numb. I drank just because everybody else was drinking and I drank because it would make me more violent. So, you know, if I was gonna get into a fight or something, we were gonna fight that day, I would get drunk. But no, I really didn't feel nothing. I mean, I had a lot of hate. I had a lot of, a lot of pain. I had a lot of resentment. You know, I, I knew I had those things because I felt them and, and you know, and every time I would get into a fight, I, I made sure that I kind of like beat it into that person. So did you have any like aspirations with life or was your mind in so many different other places? Like, did you want to, you know, a lot of people have dreams of being a professional sports person or anything like that. Did you have any future goals in your head or were you just? Honestly, man, the only dream I can remember that I had in my head was that I, wa I wanted to go to the military. I wanted to be a Marine. I wanted to fight for my country. I mean, I don't know where I got it from, but I was very patriotic as a kid. My grandparents bought me this like little army outfit for Christmas and I, I wore it till it kind of fell apart, you know, and uh, I always thought I was gonna be a Marine. That's what I thought I was gonna be. That's, I, I really thought that I was gonna leave one day and go fight for my country. So as you were growing up, did did you ever f think back to what your uncle did to you, or was it just a combination of things that ha put that anger in you? I always thought about him. I never forgot because for a long time, you know, what he did to me, I, I used to believe that that's what I liked or that's what I was supposed to do. Um, for a long time, I was confused. Um, I knew that I liked women, but I didn't know if I was supposed to like men because of what he did to me. So I was very confused and very, very mad about it. Um, I became very, very sexual. You know, I, I started masturbating at a very young, young age and started watching, you know, porno magazines, uh, stuff like that. And, and it just started polluting my, my body more and more, my mind, my soul, you know, um, it just started getting darker and darker, everything, everything. You're in Chicago, back with your dad. Um, where do we go from there? I mean, I, I was the new kid in the neighborhood, and we're talking about, a, you know, a gang-infested neighborhood where as soon as I came in, you know, I started getting bullied because I was a new kid. And I realized that summer, there was a bully that kept like hitting me. He gave me two black eyes that, that, that summer and he would just always, always hit me. And I was so terrified of fighting because of what you know, my uncle had did to me, the beatings, all that stuff that he pretty much took away all my self-confidence. So I was terrified of one-on-one -on -one fights. I don't know how to explain that. If it was a bunch of people, I would be fine. But if it was on one-on-one, -on -one, it was different. It did something to me mentally. And I remember that, that summer, I was walking with one of my gang friends and the kid came up to me, punched me. And I, I kind of like just played it off with my friend and I was like, oh, he's just playing, you know, let's go inside. Because I was scared of him. He was, he was older and bigger than me. I was in fifth grade, he was, he was a freshman, you know, and my friend Chino was like, nope. He's like, if you let him do that to you, he's going to do it all year. He's like, you're going to fight him. He's like, I'm going to make you fight him. And I got really scared, but I just went with it. You know, I've, I've always been one of those that gets really easily influenced. <laughs> So I went with it and that, in that moment, I found out just how dangerous I was 
when I got mad. I, that day I found out what my anger could do to people. And I, I, I beat them to a pulse pretty much. And then I became the bully. Every time I would see him, I would punch him, give him black eyes. And, uh, you know, it was weird because I was, I was such a little kid. I, I didn't really grow until I hit like my teenage years, you know, like 14, 15. So I was very skinny, very, just very short, small. Um, but yeah, from there, from that day on, I knew that I could use my violence to hurt people and to move up, move up in that neighborhood. Where were you at with school at that time? Were you, how were the grades, attendance? I don't even remember getting a, a report card. I don't remember going to school. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much dropped out in sixth grade. I wasn't attending no more. I would go to school just to hang out with all my friends and stuff like that, but I never went to a classroom, nothing. I just, I was gangbanging 24 seven. Did, was there any official gangs at first or was it kind of a, your crew of friends? When did it kind of get more serious as far as the gangs? Well, at first I really didn't want to commit to a gang because in Chicago, once you commit to a gang, like, it's just dangerous to move around to different areas in Chicago. They're very segregated because of the gangs. So since I got moved around so much from, you know, being at my dad's house on the weekend and then being with my grandparents and then being with my uncle, they moved me around so much because they couldn't deal with me. So I, I got moved around every three months to a different house, a different aunt, a different uncle. And uh, I just got moved around a lot. And I, I couldn't commit to one gang. So, you know, it wasn't until later that I turned 15 is when I officially got into a gang. I was one of the first members of a, it's, it was already a street gang in Chicago called the Satan Disciples, Satan Disciples, SDs. Uh, the gangs in Chicago are very uh, unique. Uh, it's one gang with different locations but it's the same gang all over Chicago, just different, like a 7-Eleven store, pretty much. And the 59 SDs had gotten started that summer. I was one of their first members. And I mean, I just remember that summer we caused havoc. Uh, there was 10 of us and we were all highly damaged. You know, all, all, the, all my friends, all my the kids that I hung around with, uh, a lot of them are dead now, a lot of them are in jail, and, and few are alive. Was there ever a moment in the beginning, uh, maybe an action you did or something took place that you realized that you were deep in it? Or did it just progress naturally? And... It just progressed, man. I, I tell people, when you're a criminal, you start graduating to, to bigger crimes because it starts to become easier, you, you, you learn to be a criminal. You learn to steal, you learn to you know, shoot guns, you, you, you learn different things and uh, it almost, like I said, you become numb to it. So you start to do it without even thinking about the consequences. I mean, we would go out looking for gang members just just to go do some damage, you know? We would walk around with guns on us and we, we call it, you know, pulling marches. Uh, everybody would just walk with guns on them and that's how it is in Chicago. It was, it was just gang banging 24 seven. Was there, did you have any moral code? Is, was there anything that was crossing the line for you as far as that gang life or were you? I, I had some codes, you know, um, no women, no children. Um, I, I hate drive-bys. I, I always thought it was like stupid. Like if you were gonna go do something, go do it to that person. You know, don't, I know it sounds, you know, crazy to have, I guess, code, but to not kill somebody doesn't have nothing to do with what we're doing, you know? So I guess you could say I had some codes in my life. So, 
How did it progress from what you were doing in Chicago uh, to ending up in Mexico once again, but in a different situation? So I had, I had a friend, her name was, uh, her name is Valerie. And uh, she was like a sister to me. She knew that I was always on the streets. She knew I was always homeless. She knew I was always hungry. <laughs> I, I, I was that kid, you know, and she always, I guess you could say, try to help me out in her own way, you know. Yeah, it was, you know, delivering drugs or, or doing criminal activities, but, you know, she got me a job. And she's the one that got me the job to go work for a family in Mexico that, you know, later progressed into something bigger. And so you were happy at that opportunity? I was very much because I, I figured that I was going to be the next El Chapo, you know, like I was going to, I was going to be somebody in life. Ambitious. Yeah. I wanted it all. So what were the opportunities that she brought to the table for you? I mean, I was, I always told people I was 16 years old making, you know, 12 grand, 10 grand, 20 here, 30 there. I mean, it changed me. Uh, it changed me and I, I thought that I had found the answer to life. Uh, money fixes everything, even my pain. So I, I started getting deeper into it and you know, I started doing my little, you know, just winning people over. Uh, I, I won some of the people over in Mexico, the families, and, and I started getting more into, you know, working f pretty much full time for them and just getting my cut and, and just staying in there. I, I wanted to learn everything that they were doing because I, I, I wanted to do it, but better. So how did you end up in the uh, Mexico prison? I started running cars for a family in Mexico, um, making sure that the cars were leaving the, the city, getting to Chicago, you know, getting the tanks off. You know, I, I guess you could say like a manager, managing everything, the money and stuff like that. And uh, on my last trip, uh, I, I got caught by the military and uh, I ended up in prison in Mexico. What was your first impressions of the prison in Mexico walking in? I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I, w I was terrified when I walked in. I just, I played it off like I wasn't. But I, I was truly scared because it, it just, it, it was bad, you know? Those, those, those horror stories that you hear about Mexican prisons, they're, they're true. They're true, it's, it's, it's real prison over there. It's not, it's not the United States. It's not, it's not a five-star hotel. You don't get three meals in a bunk. Doesn't work like that over there. And you had an altercation just walking in the door, correct? As soon as I came in, somebody wanted my, my shoes. You know, that's how it works over there. When the people that are really poor, they wait for all the new guys at the door. And as soon as the new guys come in, you know, they stab them and take their stuff. And that's just how it is over there. It's just survival of the fittest. So how long were you in that Mexican prison? I was there for four years. And then they transferred you to? Uh, the American Consul came and they transferred me to El Paso, Texas, La Latuna Federal Prison. That's where uh, Boston George was at. Um, a lot of big, big, uh, I mean, I always tell people, I, I left with a, a GED in marijuana and I came out with a PhD in cocaine. Uh, I met a lot of people while I was in the feds. I was I was the youngest kid on the yard. I was 19 years old. And they had a lot of like big mafia guys there. Like, it, it, this is back in the day when the feds housed a lot of important people, you know? And um, I just learned, I learned, I soaked it in like a sponge and, and I met a lot of connections in that prison. I made a lot of connections. So the lifestyle or the criminal activity did not uh, lessen after prison? No, it, it got deeper, deeper and darker. By this point in my life, I, I was completely numb already to everything and anything that had to do with caring or feeling or just anything. So what exactly happened after that, that first prison stint? 
you know, I, I got to see, especially in Mexico, I got to see, you know, lynchings, uh, just rapes. Uh, it was bad. It was bad. I didn't know how bad it had affected me until uh, I was on the plane with all the Americans that they were transferring. Um, I looked back and I, I could see it in their faces and their eyes that they, they, were, they were messed up. And, you know, as I sat down in my chair, I kind of said, man, you know, I'm lucky that I, I was in my prime of violence because, like, it affected me, but I thought I was okay, you know, because all the other Americans were like, on medicine, like their hair was like, straight like coming out of a mental institute, you know? And I mean, I, I know it had affected me. I knew I, I knew I was bad. I just didn't know how bad I was until later in my life. What was the most horrific thing that you saw while you were there? Honestly, it was when that pedophile guy came in, the way they beat him. I, I mean, he was trying to put his hands down on the floor and his all his bones were broken on his hands, so it, it looked like jello. I can't even explain it. It didn't even look real. It looked like a cartoon. And the way that they were beating him and, and the way they stuck the, the broom, like it was, I had never heard a human scream like that. And you know, I've, I've done damage to people. I've heard, I've seen people do it. I had never seen a human, I had never heard a human being cry like that. It really changed me that day. Did it compare to anything that you saw in American prison? No, no. You know, American prison is more like fights, stabbings, you know, stuff like that, you know. And Mexico is like rapes, murders, hangings, lynchings. It was completely different. And the affiliations that you had, you know, in the streets, they, they play a role while in prison? Not in Mexico, only in the United States. How did that uh, happen? How did that work in the United States? Well, in the United States, you know, um, my, my street gang is pretty much in every federal prison you could think of, or state prison. So, uh, land kings are pretty big. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you find your way. As soon as you walk in the door, uh, I mean, they, they, they tell you where you're gonna sit, where you're going, where's your people? You know, you have to go and check to see where your people's at. And uh, just to, before we leave the uh, Mexico prison experience, what was one way that you had to adapt quickly? Whether it be, you know, uh, relationship building or mentally, something that you had to change about yourself to survive? I wouldn't say really change because I was already numb. I was already violent. I was already, I was already a lot of things that I guess I needed to be while I was there. And if I wouldn't have been those things, I, I wouldn't have survived. Um, I, I picked up a really bad drug habit while I was there. And I mean, not even that, that couldn't numb the pain, that couldn't numb the voices, nothing. I mean, it just, it was, it was there. Yeah. So then you're in that revolving door of uh, American prison, coming back out, going back in. Um, do you think there was any type of self-sabotage? Yeah, yeah. There was times that I started to feel that I was uh, better off in there. Um, I felt smart in there. I felt like I was somebody in there. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have no education. I didn't have no job skills. I, I didn't have a lot of things that like normal people, I guess, have out here. And I, I would get frustrated. And, you know, sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes I, I have to believe that I threw the wrench in, in the machinery to make the machine break and send, send me back. You know? How did you spend your time in there? Was it? Complete, you said in Mexico that you, you know, started using things to get high. Um, in American prisons, how did you use your time? It's very different in Amer American prisons because it's very political. The gangs, it's mandatory to be on the yard. It's mandatory to work out. It's mandatory 
for everybody to eat together. There's just a lot of things that are mandatory that it, you can't, you're not gonna do your time uh, peacefully, you're not gonna do your time you know, on your own. You're, you're gonna have to ride it out with your crew and if your crew gets into a fight, then you're gonna get into a fight too. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much like winging it every day in there, man. So in the middle of going in and out, um, you came into contact with some unlikely people from my understanding. Um, tell me about your involvement, uh, meeting, and uh, being around the rapper DMX. Well, I met him through Cato, one of my very close friends. Uh, uh, he was starting his own record label in Chicago, and, and um, he became very good friends with DMX. Uh, I was always with Cato at in the, around that those days and that time, and so I got introduced to DMX and. Um, you know, me and him uh, hit it off. I mean, he was he was a cool cat. Uh, my job was just, you know, keep him safe. That was it. Like, watch his back. Uh, whenever he was in Chicago, uh, same thing with Cato. So uh, when I ended up moving out here to Arizona, you know, he had a house out here. I, I became part of the Phoenix Rough Riders. Uh, I mean, they, they say it's a motorcycle club, but it, it, I mean, it's a gang. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, you have a bunch of grown men, you know, fighting together and doing everything together. It, it's, it's either the military or it's a gang. <laughs> so, yeah. Spent a lot of time around him. What was uh, the most surprising thing, uh, maybe about his personality or anything that he did in those days? He was really humble, man. He was really humble, and he loved performing for his for his fans. Everywhere we went, you know, there was a performance in the parking lot or inside the restaurant or a prayer. I mean, we were always somewhere stuck because he would take the time, you know, to talk to everybody. And uh, we just sat there and just, you know, soaked it in, I guess you could say. DMX was always kind of one of my favorite artists because of his boldness, you know, with the prayers on stage and the songs. And obviously he glorified some other things, but it made a big impression on me as a young kid. You know, there's not a lot of masculine type dudes, at least, that uh, kind of talk about Jesus like that. So I'm curious, did he ever, you know, in your conversa conversations one-on-one -on -one with him, did he ever bring up God or, you know, uh, I guess pray at unlikely times or was there any type of uh, spirituality, I guess? I mean, with him, there was. He he talked about it. He prayed. Uh, back then, uh, I did it. I mean, I would put my head down and he would pray and, and I would kind of just do what everybody else was doing, but I wasn't listening. I wasn't, I didn't believe. Um, I was mad at him if he did exist. So uh, there really wasn't no no talks about that stuff with us, with me at least. As a kid, did you have any thoughts on God? Not really. I mean, the way I looked at it, I, I just felt like I got dealt a really bad hand. You know, I didn't, I didn't choose to be put in that situation, so I was, I was kind of like, if he does exist, I mean, why is this happening to me? And you, uh, I assume, kept that opinion for a long time? A very long time. I was very mad at him for many, many years. How did, or when did that change? In 2019, <laughs> my wife started working at the gym where I worked at. And uh, she was always talking about Jesus. And I kind of liked her, but the whole Jesus thing was throwing me off. And I just, I didn't want to hear about it. And the, and the more we talked and the more, I, you know, I got to know her, uh, I guess you could say I got curious because she was always happy. She was always happy. She was always, you know, in a good mood. She was always smiling, like just full of joy, I guess. And I thought it was fake. I thought it was fake and I would tell her all the time, I was like, why are you pretending to be so happy all the time? And I didn't understand it. I didn't comprehend it and 
I just couldn't understand how somebody could be, you know, full of joy like that. And then, you know, 2019, are you out of the revolving door uh, of getting locked up, or where were, where were you with all that? I had just got out from the last revolving door that uh, I had violated my probation from getting out in 2014. I violated in 2016. They sent me back for a year, and you know I was back out again. When you were in prison, you know you hear the term jailhouse religion. Did you see any of that, or did you come close to any of that in there, or were you too obligated to the members? No, we see we seen it a lot in prison because a lot of uh, gang members that get scared when they get sent to higher security yards because they know you know bad stuff's going to go down. They, they pretend to be Christians. They, 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 they pretend to go to church. They pretend to, you know, follow the religion, but then you catch them, you know, smoking weed or, or looking at porn and stuff like that. And they take that very serious in there. Like, you don't play with that stuff. E even the guys that don't believe don't want to mess with it because if it's true, they don't want that karma. So. Uh, they always tell the guys. They they always tell the guys that want to go that route into the religion. Yes, you could go. The gang will leave you alone. But if we catch you doing something, you're gonna pay the consequences. And that's how it happens. A lot of guys get beat and get taken off the yard because of that. Did you ever see at least one person that did you know actually become a Christian or born again, or was it all? Right. No, I, I ain't seen a lot of hardcore Christians in there that to this day, now that I know the truth, um, I have a lot of respect for them. I have a lot of respect and a lot of love for them because for them to maintain that Christian-like manner in a, pr in a place like that, um, my respects, my respects. You mentioned the truth. Um, so let's go back to your wife knowing the truth, but you didn't at the time. Uh, what happened from there? She made me watch The Shack. You know, it's a movie. I had seen the book in prison, but I had never really read it. And uh, that movie, uh, it, it changed, changed the way that I felt about God. I came to realize that, you know, he he wanted me to tell him how mad I was. He wanted me to tell him how I felt. Like he wanted all these things, and I I didn't under I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that that I could do that, or I just I didn't know nothing about religion, so I didn't even know how to call, I didn't even know how to pray. So when I watched that movie, I mean, it was. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying because I started to feel something. Something was like moving around in here and I just didn't know what it was. So uh, that's where it started. I started to get more curious after that and um, I would ask my wife questions and I have a, 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 a teacher that's my friend, John Humphrey. He ends up discipling me later, but, you know, a good Christian man has been a Christian since he was nine years old, cop for 30 years. Um, the unlikeliest friend I would ever have, and he's like one of my best friends now, um, he started, you know, teaching me and showing me and gave me some devotions to read, and he started coming over to the house. And uh, November 6th, November 6th, I fell down to my knees. And I just said, I mean, you have my attention. Like, I, I, I just didn't know what to do from there. And um, I'll never forget, I mean, the feeling I got, uh, I started crying. I, I put my head to the floor because I felt like so embarrassed that I couldn't even look up. I started confessing everything out of my mouth. I don't even know why. I didn't, I didn't even know that I had to do that. And it just all started coming out, everything, everything. 
who I hated, who I had, you know, jealousy against, who, who I lusted against, like just everything started coming out. And um, I, I just felt like a new person when I got up that day. Something was different and it was in here. So I, I started to study more. I started to study more. Um, I started looking for a church. I started befriending more Christian men. And um, here I am today. <laughs> In your early walk, what was the most surprising thing you learned about God or his characteristics? Just the love. The, just the love that you share with him is so powerful. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I love doing now is talking to him and telling him how I'm feeling and just telling him <clears throat> that I need, I need his help. I need his strength to, to get by when I'm having bad days, you know, or, or just having trouble in my life. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is to trust him. Since uh, you began your walk with the Lord, I assume you've had to get some pushback, maybe from uh, people in your past life, uh, whether it be family or anybody, um, maybe some naysayers or people that doubt that it's real, it's going to last. Um, was there any of that? Well, at the beginning, a lot of people thought I was full of crap. A lot of people thought that I was like chasing the cloud or you know chasing likes and stuff like that. And and I, I understand, I get it. I mean, they they watched me for years, you know, swearing and and saying just crazy stuff out of my my mouth, and and they couldn't understand this new JC. <laughs> they couldn't understand that. I always do the comparison. I went from being a Tasmanian devil to Winnie the Pooh. You know, I'm winning the pool now. So it, it's like, for them, it was a shocker and they didn't believe it. Didn't believe it because I mean, I was that, I was that person for 40 something years. So uh, the, the biggest, I say I, that eye opener for me was when I went back to the gym after I started my walk because I had to apologize to everybody that I was rude to and that I offended and I hurt their feelings. Like I had to apologize to every single person in there. And um, it was very powerful. As far as forgiveness goes, how do you approach it uh, in, in terms of forgiving yourself and forgiving others? I think it, I've gotten better at forgiving others. <laughs> I'm a little harder on myself. I'm forgiving myself, you know, but I'm, I'm learning. And I, I know it's gonna be like uh, a life walk, you know, a life process. The sanctification is gonna last forever, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I'm learning, man. I'm learning to, you know, forgive myself. But uh, I've gotten really good at forgiving others, and and um, it's been a big healer in my life. And for believers, uh, most of us know about the process of sanctification and uh, how it works with different people. Um, before you were a believer, you know, you talked about when you were 10, how you started, you know, smoking and drinking. Uh, can you touch on the addictions that came later in your life? And then once you became a believer, uh, how did that turn out? Well, I, my biggest addiction, addictions as I got older were, you know, the alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, I mean, I mean porn, women, money, they, they, those addictions got really out of control as I grew, I grew older. Um, when I started my walk, uh, just everything stopped. Was it immediate or was there a process? No, it was immediate. Even my swearing, um, you know, uh, everything stopped for I want to say, I want to say for about six months, you know, before I had my first fall, my first, you know, uh, moment where I thought that I had screwed everything up. And um, did you think you had to be perfect to be a Christian at first? 
Yeah, you know, I, I really thought I, I had to be perfect and, um, you know, God was using me a lot. You know, I was speaking at a lot of places, so it, it put more pressure on me to, to, I guess you could say, try to be perfect. And when I failed, it, it hit me really hard. You know, it hit me really hard. I thought I had lost my my salvation. Um, I was guilty. Uh, I mean, I, I was I was even about to just, you know, go back to just being me again. And um, I, I had some very strong brothers in my life now that are Christian and, and they're, they're believers and, and they they huddled around me. They huddled around me and to this day, they've been my, my, my line of defense. You know, um, they, they're right there in front of me. And I, I got a really good team, a really good team that, that just kept me on my P's and Q's. Yeah, and uh, that's a big misconception with non-believers. They think Christians got it all together and they can never be a Christian because they can never get it all together. Those are the kind of Christians we need. <laughs> 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 the ones that don't have it together because we'll get it together. We'll get it together together <laughs> with God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Speaking of together, um, is there anything that you saw in the gangs growing up uh, in prison with you know the cliques or anything, or is there anything in those groups that you saw that could be used for good? You know, maybe in the Christian atmosphere, you know, maybe camaraderie or uh, more of a sense of accountability or brotherhood. Anything that you saw. Everything that you just said uh, that gangs use to keep their guys in line is that is what we need as Christian men, because it ain't easy, man. It ain't easy. It ain't easy to not be part of this world because everybody is. So you need some strong brothers to stand with you, to keep it real, to tell you. You know, you, you must stop. Not to make you feel guilty, not to shame you or anything, but to tell you, you know, we're, we're here. Like, call us if you need us or, you know, it's things like that. Like the camaraderie, everything that, that's the one thing that I miss the most out of prison is the camaraderie that I had with my guys. You know, we went to the yard together. We went to lunch together. We watched TV shows together. We ate together. We fought together. We bled together. You know, it was a camaraderie that, just, I don't think, I don't think you see it out here. Yeah. Um, some would say in the American church, there's a problem with uh, masculinity. Uh, what is that, how does masculinity and Christianity go hand in hand for you? Honestly, uh, I feel the toughest uh, since God taught me self-control. Um, that's true toughness right there. Um, that's being a real man, you know, having self-control and, and loving God. Um, not because you have to do it, because you want to do it. And there's other ways to being tough, you know? <laughs> we have the misconception that being tough is like, you're, you're like this fighter that beats everybody up and, and then that's not it. That's not it. You know who a tough guy is? Jesus is a tough guy. Because he knew what was gonna happen to him the next day. And he still went with it. That's a tough guy. Because I don't know if I would be able to do that. I'm gonna be honest. If you told me they're gonna kill you tomorrow, they're gonna put you on a cross, they're gonna whoop you, they're gonna do other things, I would probably fly out to Hawaii. What are some things that you do um, to grow spiritually, like your your day to day? I read scripture every day, Psalms, Proverbs. Um, my devotion every day, like it's no. If I don't have the books in my hand, then I do the app on my phone. But there's not one day that I'm not feeding my soul. Or, or learning the truth. 
um, because you'll, you'll never stop learning. Once you start reading and understanding, it, it's uh, something that's going to feed you for the rest of your life. Um, as we know, the body is a temple, and that is uh, a huge part of your ministry, Wrong to Strong. Uh, tell me about that, how that all started, and how did fitness, uh, the fitness lifestyle begin for you? Well, I've been, I've been working out since I was nine years old. It's like the only thing that my dad taught me, uh, how to lift weights. And I, I just, I fell in love with uh, working out, doing sit-ups as a kid. So uh, I've always kind of done it. I've always lifted weights. I've always worked out. I've always done something. Um, back when I was younger, obviously, it was for, you know, ego purposes. I wanted a six-pack. I wanted to look good. I wanted the girls to look at me, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, as I grew older, I started to understand how important it is to keep the body clean. You know, even after all those years that I put all that poison into me, all those drugs, all those, all that hate, all that stuff. <sighs> but man, you know, not drinking, not smoking, going to bed early, waking up early, uh, eating good has really showed me how a machine should run. Like no pop-ups, no, you know, explosions in the exhaust system, no, 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 nothing like that because your body reacts to how you treat it. You treat it with love, it gives you love back. And so you use, you know, you, you train specific people out there and you use this as an opportunity to witness. Yes. What's that experience like? You know, at first, when I first started my walk, I was like, uh, I'm going to have my church one day. I'm going to open up my church one day. And I just kept saying that all over, all the time. And then one day when I was praying, I felt it in my heart that he was telling me, well, you already have your church. You have your YouTube channel and you have your gym where you're at. And uh, after I felt that, I mean, I don't miss an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Um, even if I don't know them, I'll find a way to tell them something. Uh, every, I know everybody at the gym. I greet everybody at the gym. I carry myself to the point where people want to ask me sometimes. How do you, how do you witness? Uh, what's the regular way for you? Do you let them start the conversation or ask the questions? Or do you kind of lead them there? Or just what's the regular way for you? Or is there a regular way? Is it different every time? It's different every time, man. You know, and that's at the beginning. That's why at the beginning I really didn't do it because I used to believe that everything had to be perfect. That I had to memorize this, 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 this prayer to get you to come to Jesus, or I had to memorize this to show you. And, and no, you know, uh, you know, Jesus said it himself, I'm going to send you a helper. And half of the time when I start preaching, I start saying something, I'm like, where is that coming from? Like, I, I know where it's coming from, but it's, you know, I didn't learn how to read and write till I was 30. And I barely... You know, I could say I'm like fifth, fourth grade. But for me, sometimes I listen to my talks. I listen to when I'm talking about, you know, God. And, and I'm, just, I'm just taken back, man, for what, what he's been doing in my life, in my heart, and just in my body, my mind. I've never been this fit before. Like, if everything has changed. What would you say brings you the most joy these days? When I'm at, um, of service, I think I spend more time in service now than I do in working. Um, I work at the church on Thursdays from 2 to 5. I volunteer. I shouldn't say work, but it's work. <laughs> uh, I go to the Dream Center on Saturdays. Um, I hit up the homeless shelter, you know, with John. Uh, I just, I love being able to show people love now. I, I love the way that people trip out because they see this big tat tatted up Mexican and they're always expecting something different. And 
they always get Jesus. So it's uh, it's been fun, man. It's been fun because like I've always been like a mischievous kid. I've always been like I guess you could say like a little troublemaker. But now that you know I'm <laughs> I'm on Team Jesus, <laughs> I, I have to make sure that I'm I'm being that person myself. You know me in a good way. So like right now when I, you know, stopped the hose for that guy that was watering the plants. <laughs> <laughs> to me, you know, I got a kick out of it, you know, and it made me laugh. Yeah. It wasn't something bad, yeah. you know, but the one thing that I've come to realize is that God loves you just the way that you are. He made you that way. So that's the way you're supposed to be, you know? What would you say to those guys that say the church would burn down if I were to walk in? That's why they can't go. No, I would tell them that's what I used to say. And I meant it. Because it was true. So, if he could change me, he could change anybody. Yeah. And what would you say to those, to someone, a uh, guy or a girl, that's in such a low place, whether it be addiction, or uh, just reaping what they're sowing in life circumstances, and they don't think there's a way out, what would you say to them? Give them a chance. What do you have to lose? Right. You've already did everything under the sun that got you to that place. Give them a chance. Let, let Jesus do what he did in my life to you. Give them a chance. So that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. In the, uh, so what is the future? Plan for JC, wrong to strong, and everything you got going on. Everything's going on. <laughs> uh, we have uh, my books about to get released this year. Um, we're working. We're working on pretty much uh, a new logo um, for the clothing line. We got a supplement line that we're talking about. Uh, my online, uh, you know, coaching training has really turned into one of my priorities because I, I want to step out of the gym. I don't want to be at the gym no more in person. I, I want to be able to help more people. And for me to do that, I'm going to have to be, you know, an online coach. So that's one of the biggest things that I'm working on right now and just getting everything together man, with my, my family, my, my wife. You know, I, I've been going through some storms too. You know, it's, it's not perfect when you become a Christian. You still have a lot of the same problems as everybody else. You just learn to deal with them different and uh, you keep moving forward because you trust God. You trust that everything that is getting put or taken away in your life is for a reason. It's for a purpose, a, a season. Amen. Well, I really appreciate, appreciate the interview. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for flying me out here. It was very, uh, I mean, Everybody knows how scared I am of water. I got in the water today with this guy. I mean, this whole trip, this whole, I don't, I don't even want to say vacation because it wasn't really a vacation, <laughs> but it, it's been very healing for me in, in a way. And uh, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful that God put you in my life. I'm very grateful that you're part of my family now. And uh, Man, I would rather, I, I, I couldn't think of no one else that I would rather have done the stuff that I did with today but you. So, appreciate that, brother. It means a lot.